Well, happy epiphany, everyone. Now, I realize I'm saying that just a little bit early here, especially when we're filming. It's only a few days after Christmas. And you might say, but this is the service for Sunday, January 3, and Epiphany doesn't start till January 6. That's correct. But we're celebrating the day of Epiphany early so that then the next Sunday then will be baptism of our Lord and we'll be off and racing through the Epiphany season. More on that later. But we're here in beautiful Trinity uh, Lutheran Church in Clawson, Michigan, celebrating with our Epiphany tree here still with us and it's absolutely gorgeous. And we are also uh, in, uh, welcoming all the people from Prince of Glory uh, as we continue in this partnership together. Now, one other thing we need to say about that partnership is that the two congregations are working together with a joint call uh, committee that is looking to find your next pastor. They've had a second interview with someone and there's going to be a joint council meeting on that topic coming up here in January. That's about all I have to share on that front uh, as we move forward. But I want to, again, welcome all of you for being here. And again, you're probably tired of me saying this, but I'm going to say it again anyways. If you've got bread and wine or grape juice available to you at this, now's the time to gather it in and have it ready for that point later in our service. And we're going to begin with just the briefest moments of silence. And then from Matt, we get to hear an incredible prelude uh, doing an instrumental of, as with gladness, men of old. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have filled all the earth with the light of your incarnate word. By your grace, empower us to reflect your light in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. And again, we're blessed to be able to hear uh, the first Noel as an instrumental from Matt.
Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the second chapter. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born the king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, who are by no means the least of the rulers of Judah, from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time that the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I also may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense. And myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the gospel of our Lord. Well, I started out today's service talking about Epiphany and the season of Epiphany that we're in. And it begins, of course, the season of Epiphany with the day of Epiphany. Now, one of the things you might be asking is, what the heck does epiphany mean? Uh, some of you may know just right at the top of uh, your head exactly what it means. Others may not. One of the best describers of it that I've ever seen actually comes from the Peanuts cartoon. Good old Snoopy. I love me some Snoopy. Um, but in that, Charles Schultz would often draw when people got an insight into something. And if you remember what that image was, there's always a little light bulb going off over their heads. And that's what an epiphany is, when that light goes on and there's a new understanding, a new way of perceiving something, a new way of experiencing uh, what it is we've had that epiphany concerning. And in the context of the church, it's always about who Jesus is and what he means for us in our lives today. And so in this season of epiphany, we look for those light bulb moments when things can kind of turn on for us and help us to see in new ways, maybe, you know, what we've known for a while, but perhaps there can be that switch that kind of flips for us in a good and positive way. Now, Epiphany comes at the end of the 12 days of Christmas. So again, uh, there's all these arguments about how long does your Christmas tree stay up and all those sorts of things. If you want to be a liturgical purist, it stays up until January 6th. That's the day of Epiphany and the day that the uh, tree gets to come down. Now, Epiphany is also, uh, the day of Epiphany, is one of six feast days uh, that are in the church calendar. And they all occur in the first half of our calendar uh, year, really, I guess, starting with uh, uh, Christmas on December 25th, of course, and ending with Trinity Sunday, which is usually late May to mid-June. Somewhere in there uh, is when that one uh, normally comes up. The six feast days are beginning, of course, with Christmas and then Epiphany and then Transfiguration, then Easter, Pentecost, and Trinity Sunday, winding up the uh, six of the, fest of the feast Sundays. And then the rest of the year, that long green season, as we often call it, looking at the colors of the pyramids on the uh, altar and pulpit is called ordinary time. No big feast celebration days uh, during that time until we get back from Trinity Sunday all the way back to the next Christmas.
Now, that little bit of church history and uh, sort of um, our way of doing worship in our buildings aside, let's also talk about what Epiphany means for us and also some of what it meant way back when at that first Epiphany. Now, we had some fun a little while ago talking about uh, uh, in our Christmas Eve service about uh, the wise men don't show up at that Christmas Eve time. They come later, their day is Epiphany. And again, you just got to hear the lesson. Our carol that we're going to talk about today is We Three Kings. And it's all about the coming of these three visitors from the East. And it causes something of a little hubbaloo uh, when they arrive. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about is who are these guys <laughs> and uh, where do they come from and what are they about and anything else? Well, probably the best translation of who these visitors are looking at the Greek uh, language there would be magi, to call them three magi, which can then be uh, sort of transliterated out in English to be magicians. Three magicians. And how different does our uh, story sound if we talk about and three magicians from the East uh, came? But who do we think they are? Well, the scriptures really don't give us much insight beyond this passage in Matthew. And Matthew's gospel is the only place that they appear. This is all we got to work with. Uh, that, that's it. Now, we have other not biblical texts that tell us a little bit about how the word magi and who it was applied to in that time frame. And they were mainly uh, Zoroastrians. Now, uh, that is a religion. And at one point, probably 2000 years before Christ, it was probably the biggest religion in the world. And it existed for about 6,000 years, even uh, before Christ. And so their main tenets were about looking to the stars, looking up towards the heavens for answers and doing a lot of work with astronomy and also searching other uh, religious texts for key dates that might be coming, things like that. Now, one of the things that you might find, and I think that Matthew's contemporary readers may have almost found humorous even, was that these non-Jewish, Visitors from somewhere else show up at the capital of Judaism in its central city with its enormous temple and ask the question, oh, where's your Messiah? Because we've been following the star that indicates him. And they seem to have caught everybody there flat footed, right? The people who should know, the ones who should have been paying attention to their own religious texts, don't have a clue what's going on. They got a quick scramble and find some answers. But these probably Zoroastrians from somewhere further to the east, and again, we have no idea where that east was, where at the time of uh, Jesus, things were sort of the strongest for the Zoroastrians would have been in what is today Iran. And so uh, back then probably used the term Persia a little uh, more uh, contemporaneously that way. But that's probably where they're from. But again, we don't know. But here they are, sort of the ultimate outsiders, asking pretty intimate questions of the insiders that the insiders don't know and have to scramble and look to pay attention to from their own religious texts. And they come up with their answer and say, well, it's in Bethlehem. Just a little town, just a little bit south of here. You've only missed the mark by that much. And so they head off to Bethlehem. Now, it's also important that we notice Herod's reaction to all of this. Did you catch that? When these guys from the East come in and ask, where's the person been born that's supposed to be the king? Well, he's the king, right? And even though he's murdered a couple of them, he's expecting one of his sons to be king after him. And then his grandson to be king after him, and so forth. And now you're asking this question about somebody else being king. And so you might think, well, of course he's frightened. It's a displacement of him. 
But then notice what comes next. He was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. Now, I don't think, as Matthew writes this to us, that he means that every single you know, shopkeeper, anybody else in Jerusalem, even knew what was going on in the palace. I doubt it. Uh, that's probably uh, not the case. But when he says all Jerusalem, it's sort of the who's who of who's running Jerusalem is nervous with him. Because number one, their fortunes are tied to Herod. And let's also be clear, Herod's very presence as king, and we use that title somewhat loosely, is only there because Rome was in the habit of finding local people who could be puppet rulers and whose only real job was to make sure that taxes flowed back to Rome from that province. Beyond that, Rome didn't care too terribly much how they ruled, what they did. As long as they, in essence, no Roman soldiers got hurt and the tax monies that were expected flowed when they were supposed to flow on time. That's really all that Rome cared about. But if there's now a new entity who's going to be king, that potentially upsets the balance with Rome. And all of the people at that time frame would have known that an upset Rome is not a good Rome for the locals. And so they want to keep peace at nearly any cost. And then we have Herod going and meeting with these wise men from the east and telling them, go, it's Bethlehem. And when you're in Jerusalem, or if he's meeting them at his uh, summer palace, if that's where he is, he can just look out the window and point to Bethlehem. It's just right there. It's not very far away. I know in our uh, uh, sort of American cultural uh, place, we think of Jerusalem over here, Bethlehem way over here, and it's really not that far. You can see one from the other. If you're up on the hilltops, you can see exactly where it is. He says, go. Get to Bethlehem. Search diligently for this child. And then, once you've found him, come back to me, tell me where he is, and then I'll go. Now, that's actually a perfectly reasonable thing. Folks would not expect kings to go out and do the diligent searching. Kings have sort of people to do that for them. And since these wise men from the east were already going and doing it, he figures, I'll just use them. That'll be easy enough. Come back and tell me. But of course, we know the rest of the story. And we know that Herod had no, no intention of coming to pay homage. Instead, his intentions were a little bit more murderous. But now let's come to the wise men themselves. We know so little about them. Over time in history, uh, names have been applied to them. Uh, you might uh, usually... Um, Melchior and Balthazar, you see their names, and then another one called either Caspar or Gaspard, depending upon sort of which language route uh, your story comes from. But again, those names have just been applied in the later centuries. We have no idea their names. They travel and they bring gifts. And we can also, in a sense, make fun of some of the gifts that they brought. I've seen all sorts of pretty funny memes about yeah, if the wise men had been wise women, the gifts would have been a whole lot more practical to the situation of what was going on there. Uh, gold, I guess, is always good, right? Cash is always helpful. But uh, frankincense and myrrh? Uh, why do we even mess with that? Now, again, I'm concluding this series of sermons where we've taken Christmas carols and uh, the gospel text and kind of put them together. The one I obviously want to look at with you here uh, this week is We Three Kings. Now, We Three Kings was written by an Episcopal priest, actually. And unlike almost all the other Christmas carols out there, the same guy wrote, he had incredible talent, the same guy wrote the words who also wrote the music. He did them both. Now, what's interesting, his name is uh, John Henry Hopkins, Jr., Episcopal priest, I already told you that. He was serving a parish in uh, Williamsburg, Pennsylvania in 1857 when he wrote this piece. 
But he didn't actually write it for his congregation to use, although they did use it there. But he was also an instructor at the General Theological Seminary in New York. That was his alma mater, and he'd had a job there as the principal teacher of music there. And he wrote it for the Christmas uh, season services in 1857. He wrote it, put the music to it, did it all himself, got it prepared, and then had it sung there at the General Theological Seminary in New York. Later, he got it published in 1863, and off it went, uh, and was incredibly well-received, and is part of our Christmas epiphany traditions down to this day. The carol itself has an interesting composition. It's got five verses with a chorus after each one, and the first verse kind of sets up the story. The last verse kind of wraps things up. And then the three verses in between are, in a sense, told about each of the individual uh, visitors from the East. The first with his gift of gold, the second with his gift of frankincense, and the third with his gift of myrrh. Now, a little bit about those gifts and what they have come to symbolize uh, in our church. The first one of gold. That of Jesus being king, and there's probably no more kingly gift than gold that one could give, and also uh, representing power and what is, in a sense, most deemed worthy on earth is worth giving to our king, our true king, Jesus. The second gift that is brought, frankincense, Not something you're probably used to, but you can sort of break that word apart and see the word incense in there. And that's exactly what it is. It is an incense that is often burned in temples. It was considered to be very uh, expensive and one that you would only use in the uh, sort of the highest of times and uh, for those appropriate points uh, in worship to use it. And again, symbolizing that Jesus is not only our king, but also our high priest, the one who leaves us in life through our faith and uh, worship. And that gift of frankincense symbolizing that. The third one is almost kind of awkward. Have you ever been at uh, a party when somebody uh, either told a joke that was utterly inappropriate and it fell uh, flat and there was this awkward moment of silence? Have you ever been at a party when somebody brought a gift that was just completely inappropriate to things and things just kind of fell flat? I wonder if at that first epiphany, they've received the gold, they've received the frankincense, and the third guy steps up and says, I got some myrrh here. (laughs) Because myrrh is used in the embalming process for dead bodies. That's its purpose. It's a really pungent, uh, strong-scented, incense, but more of a a balm that would be applied. And the idea is to override the stench of death with something a little more appealing that way and to cover that. And then all of a sudden the symbolism of it becomes clearer, doesn't it? Looking forward, even at the birth time, even at this time that's showing up immediately after the birth to give these gifts, showing where Jesus is ultimately headed. Now, when he first wrote his piece, uh, Father Hopkins intended uh, for it to be sung in a certain way. He had the full choir sing the first and the fifth verses. All those voices joined in. The three in the middle were uh, sung by soloists. And at his time, and also I think sort of stepping into the role of the three wise men, were uh, three male voices, and one would sing about gold, one the verse about frankincense, and one the verse about myrrh. If you ever hear it presented that way, it will often be some guy with an incredibly deep bass voice who sings about myrrh uh, being his gift. It's bitter perfume. And again, listen to the lyrics. We're going to have the song immediately following the sermon here in just a few moments. With all these gifts that are brought, what does Epiphany and the Day of 
ultimately mean for us? I think that there's a few things that in our day we should not fail to miss. Number one, we don't know exactly how long after Christmas, in our church here it's 12 days, we don't know exactly how long after the birth it was that the wise men showed up. But you notice that they come to a house in Bethlehem. Now again, if you recall our Christmas Eve time together, we talked about how that whole idea of no room at the inn and uh, being out in a barn, not quite how Palestine worked at that time, that Jesus was probably born in a house. The animals were just in the house. That's sort of how it worked there. And is this the same house? Probably. Uh, wherever they were staying, either with family or friends or new acquaintances, whatever it was, that is where the wise men come to, to this house uh, in Bethlehem where they are. And we cannot miss that Jesus isn't born into comfort. He isn't born in any place that's easy. He's born to people who had to get up and move because an, a uh, government told them that they had to and that they must be on the move. We also can't miss the fact of the reading that comes immediately following this one, that when the wise men leave and Herod realizes they're not coming back to tell him exactly where this one child is, we cannot miss how those in power react to God doing something new. Herod reacts murderously. And then we can't miss that it's Mary, Joseph, and this tiny baby who have to flee to a faraway place all the way down into Egypt in order to escape Herod. We cannot miss that our Lord, in sort of the political parlance of the day, was an immigrant, an alien, a refugee. And it's only later that they're able to return home to Nazareth and make a family life there. The other things that we really shouldn't miss in this particular passage are also that it's the wise men, those visitors from the East, those magi, who come because they have questions. Because they're not of the Jewish faith, they probably don't know all the tenets of it and all the stuff you're supposed to do and everything like that. Instead, they show up and ask questions. What's going on? How's this work? What can you who are part of the faith tell us? The ultimate outsiders coming to those on the inside with questions. Now, my dear friends, especially from Trinity and from Prince of Glory, I want to leave us with a question, too. It starts out with a presupposition on my part. And that is that in Clawson, that in Madison Heights, that in Oakland County, that in Macomb County, we could go bigger, but let's just stay there. That we are surrounded by people who have questions about Jesus. But... They have heard in our media about what it means to be a part of the church, and they are turned off by that. And so to me, the fundamental question of Epiphany Day becomes, how do we, who know who this Jesus is, have been so fortunate to experience his grace, his mercy, and his love, how do we, travel out with that news to those with questions. I invite you to ponder that with me, especially as we step forward into a new, uncertain, unknown future. And oftentimes those words unknown, uncertain, those can provoke anxiety in us. We like tried and true. We like having things. We know exactly what's next. Well, let's be clear. In 2021, we don't know exactly what's next. But you know who does? God. You know who's already there ahead of us waiting? God. And let's step forward 
with faith, with confidence, into the arms of the one who is already there. Amen. Redeeming God, 
You gather together your people from the farthest parts of the earth. Protect your church from stumbling. Let it not be overcome by sorrow, division, or despair. Make us radiant with goodness, that we may live always to the praise of your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You bring together heaven and earth. All creation testifies to your splendor. Hold the ecosystems of this earth in delicate balance, from coastlands to farmlands, forests to wetlands, deserts to rainforests. Show us new ways to live in harmony with the world around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You overflow with grace upon grace. Expand the imaginations of those who serve in positions of authority. Open their hearts to the needs of the nations and communities. Protect all those in harm's way and those risking danger for the sake of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You bring consolation to those who weep. Embrace those who feel far off, excluded, or defeated. Accompany those living with chronic and invisible illness. Sustain the weak and the weary. Refresh those who labor under the weight of pain or sickness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You come to us in the beauty of darkness and of light. Bring justice and reconciliations to communities divided by oppressions or misuse of power. Guide us to speak holy words of advocacy and truth. Help us to honor your image in one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You turn our mourning into joy. We give thanks for those who have died in faith. With all the saints, give us our inheritance in Christ. In the fullness of time, gather us all together in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, come quickly to us with grace upon grace as we lift these and all our prayers to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I invite all of you to uh, bring your bread and your wine or grape juice front and center as we begin to celebrate our meal together. And it is in our togetherness, even as we're spread uh, across our neighborhoods, that we remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And I offer, along with all of you, the body of Christ is given for you. In the same way, after supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, there at home, I invite all of you to take your grape juice or wine, and the body of, and the blood of Christ is shed for you. We join together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ continue to strengthen us and keep us in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray.
O God, the host at every meal, at this table you spread out a feast for all peoples, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Send us from this banquet to invite others into these good things, to let justice roll down like waters, and to care for the least of our sisters and brothers. Through Jesus Christ, our Sovereign and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Mothering God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God. And now we get to enjoy this little light of mine. <laughs> 